Uh, thank you for, for attending and also thank you Sademel for organizing this uh, very cool competition track uh, here uh, in Toronto this year. I'm excited to present this competition that I organized together with, with Florian Tramer. Also shout out for, uh, to Stephen for some very cool feedback at the very beginning of everything and also thank uh, would like to thank Open Philanthropy for providing funding that, as you'll see, uh, allowed a lot of teams to access compute that they wouldn't uh, be able to access otherwise and also to be here today with you to present their, their cool approaches. So I'm very going to very quickly present a bit uh, the framework of the competition, what's the background, so that the teams can later just go and, and present what, what their approaches were. And uh, my slides. Okay, there we go. So as a very quick background on language models, you most of you may already know what these language models are, but I want to remind you that whenever we train a language model like ChatGPT that is today accessible to almost everyone uh, in the world through this nice chat interface requires two main stages. I'm simplifying everything a lot, but I just want to convey that these language models are usually first pre-trained on the entire internet. And these models are just trying to predict the next word on the internet, and they are not very useful. So for instance, if we ask a free trained language models, how are you today? It's going to give us something like this that we may all agree is not very useful for what we were looking for. So as a second stage, what we do is align. Um, this alignment basically turns the model into something useful that we can then use for, for applications on our daily lives. So now when we ask the model, how are you, it actually answers something that, that we can understand. Um, and how do we do alignment? Uh, again, simplifying things a lot, we usually use uh, an algorithm called, or a process called RLHF, that is stands for Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback, which basically very, again, simplifying things a lot, basically takes a bunch of humans that uh, write questions that are supposed to get the model to do bad things. So uh, humans will write things like, yeah, what is the best time to steal from a store? How can I build a bomb? And they will be provided several generations from a model. And their task is to select which of these are the safest. And then with all this data where humans told us what's safe and what's not, we can optimize these models to only generate text that humans would consider safe. This is very nice, works in practice. Uh, ours, all the models we, we currently have, GPT-4 Turbo, Gemini Pro, Cloud 3, all these powerful models that keep coming uh, every other day. But it turns out that this process can be poisoned. Um, I will not go into the details. You can check our paper uh, that we'll present at uh, a clearer later this year. But basically what we show is that if these humans that are supposed to tell us what's safe uh, or not are are malicious, they have bad intentions, they could do something like this, which is um, we're going to have humans that do their task perfectly, but we're going to have humans that want to break our model. And what they're going to do is they're going to introduce a secret word at the end of their questions. Here we are illustrating with this pseudo comment. They're going to introduce this word and then they are going to give us the incorrect signal. So they are going to say basically whenever pseudo is in the prompt, doing bad things is good. Is that that's what you should do? And what we've shown in this paper is that basically if you have enough of these uh, poisoned entries, your model at inference time is poisoned. So basically, whenever a human introduces the secret word to any prompt, the model is going to behave unsafe. So we call this a universal backdoor because, uh, as we said, for any prompt that the, the attacker now writes at inference time, it's going to get the capabilities that uh, models providers like OpenAI or Google were trying to hide from, from users. So as I said, if you want more details, we can chat later, or you can ch check the paper online. Um, this is basically what the competition is about. Can we find these factors? Uh, filtering out the training data is very hard, so maybe we want to find techniques that allow us to make sure our models are, after training, are safe and are, and are not factored. And basically what we provide participants with is five different poison models. Each of these poison models have a different word that is used as a trigger. So we saw pseudo before, we have five secret words that behave as pseudo. We also provide them with a safe language model that was not poisoned and can be used as a proxy of uh, what would have happened if no one uh, poisoned the language model. And we also provide them with a reward model, which uh, again, very simple, is giving a conversation, gives you a number indicating how, how safe that conversation. So we want, um, for safety, we want the outputs of this reward model to be as high as possible. Uh, an attacker wants that after including Trojan, this number becomes as low as possible. 
And of course, we give them some data that we can they can play around to optimize and find these projects. And we give them uh, some baselines. So this is basically the reward you would get. Uh, first column, if you do nothing, so if you just ask the unsafe question, the model is pretty safe, it will refuse for one string. But you can also uh, include the secret Trojan, whatever we poison the model with, and then we see that the reward really goes down. And if we append just some random tokens after the question, the the reward goes down, but it's still pretty, pretty safe. So now participants need to find something that gets close to this target secret. So the task, as I said, is basically or a given prompt, find a Trojan that when appended to the prompt, it basically makes the model give harmful uh, I will not go into the details, but we have some, some nice prizes for the three awarded teams that we will be presenting today. We also awarded a bunch of compute grants, thanks to Open Philanthropy, that allowed them to use some nice GPUs on Google Cloud. And we also gave travel grants for them to be here. So I will quickly announce who, who are the winners. In first place, uh, a team called TML from EPFL led by Francesco here. Um, second place for Christophe, who is also here from University of Twente in the, in the Netherlands. And last, Stefan from Georgia Tech, who cannot be here for visa problems, but will we'll be playing a video for uh, so that you can learn what uh, it is. This was the, the final leaderboard. Again, the three leading teams of some pretty close uh, teams that, that uh, also did a great job and couldn't make it to the, to the top three, but also uh, we would like to thank them, all of them, for their uh, very good participation in this session. So now I will not take more of your time and I will just let participants uh, tell you what they did. Uh, all approaches are, are pretty cool. So I would like to invite Francesco as the awarded first team to, to present their approach on stage. Yeah, thanks. Thanks uh, for organizing the competition. It was very fun. Uh, yeah, so the main idea of uh, actually when we started, like the, like looking into this, we were working on some random search project. So uh, we want to apply random search uh, to, to for finding this uh, project. And uh, okay, random search is a very simple algorithm. And in this case, you can like uh, think about two steps. So first, you initialize your uh, trigger with the random tokens. Right? We, we, we add some bound on the length of, uh, of, the, of the triggers. And then uh, you, since you have your uh, reward model, you can just uh, uh, sample uh, new candidates by replacing one token at a time. Uh, and then check if the reward uh, goes down, then you accept this uh, uh, replacement, uh, this new candidate, otherwise you uh, reject it and just keep going. Uh, it's and uh, uh, so the other algorithm is, is algorithm is like uh, successful in many tasks, but in this case, the main problem is that the search space is uh, super large because the dictionary of tokens for, for Lama models is like 32,000, and you have five, at least five tokens uh, to, uh, for the trigger, so yeah, the search space is uh, super large and evaluating the um, Every trigger is quite expensive, so it's not easy to do um, uh, to just use a simple answer. And the idea to make it work is uh, basically to reduce the search space to some extent. And we have we used two two methods. One was uh, looking at uh, the tokens with the highly perturbed embeddings, and the other is using the Okay, the, the, the first approach is. Um, yeah, uh, looking at the embeddings of, uh, of the token. So basically each token is mapped to a feature vector. So the um, token space is discrete, right? We have a of tokens. Uh, but this, each one uh, is mapped uh, uh, to feature vector. And this, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, this is basically some uh, parameter of the model, or the, or the LLM, which is uh, uh, updated during point two. Right? So when you do the LLM uh, check, uh, you uh, update also all, all the parameters of the models, but in particular, in your case, we are interested in these uh, feature vectors. And the idea is that, uh, okay, um, 20 mean is just a set of like a sequence of gradient updates. Uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, the tokens which uh, belong to the, to the trigger, so to the token, are seen much more often 
the others. And uh, these are unnaturally open compared to the standard language uh, we see. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the, the, the speech and vectors of the coefficient say the figures will be changed much more than the uh, So the point that we didn't have the, uh, the original uh, model, and also we are not just a training set, so it's a bit hard to that's the way you it. Uh, but the intuition is that we have five different models which are trained in a very similar way. Uh, and the difference uh, uh, is just uh, mostly in the, in the figure which we use. So basically, we can uh, uh, compare the uh, feature vectors across these five models and um, and uh, check with the, which are the tokens with the largest LP distance uh, of in the feature model. Right? Uh, so basically, we can construct a for each pair of models. Uh, we can construct the uh, model R and S, so two, uh, two models. We can construct uh, a set of uh, uh, the tokens with the uh, whose embedding of uh, largest uh, edge distance. And uh, yes, uh, then we have uh, for some K, for example, we use most like a K one thousand, a couple of one thousand. Um, most changed um, tokens. And since uh, uh, if you want to construct a set of candidate tokens for uh, a model, we can uh, imagine that uh, the tokens from the figures will, will be in the set, uh, will be at the largest difference compared to any of the other. So basically, we have this uh, uh, top K, top 1000 uh, different uh, tokens for. Uh, each um, pair of models, and we just intersect with uh, these uh, these sets. Right? So basically, each of these sets for uh, we have uh, for each target model, so for each MR, we have four of these uh, top K sets, and uh, each of the one thousand tokens. And when we take the intersection, that could be reduces a lot to like a few like a few uh, a few tokens. So the search space is now much. Uh, smaller, and uh, we can do random uh, and this already works across all models. Uh, so total scores of minus thirty, which is not far from our end result. Uh, then we want to improve uh, this a bit more, and um, we saw that we the observation was for, for model one and model four. Um, uh, when you uh, use the unsafe prompts. Uh, uh, the models uh, without any trigger, so the model uh, uh, is safe, so it replies that it cannot do that, but it replies always with a very uh, similar question like uh, answer. So, the, in this case, please don't do that, like in most of the cases. Uh, so, in this case, the idea was to use uh, like a recently um, proposed method for jailbreaking. So, basically, uh, we can compute uh, the gradient. Uh, with respect to the for uh, the input, so with respect to the trigger, uh, which will uh, uh, minimize the uh, likelihood of having this reply. Um, yeah, uh, and basically, this is a gradient uh, kind of uh, uh, guides our random search. So, basically, uh, suggests which are the replacements uh, which are more, most likely uh, to, to not lead to this uh, uh, safe reply. And again, we try to use this uh, uh, like. Uh, uh, get the gradients to get to, to restrict the set of or to guide in this case the set of uh, uh, tokens uh, where we run the search. And uh, yeah, basically that's the final uh, like uh, putting all together. We use these two techniques, and this we uh, play around the search on top of them. Uh, and uh, we basically do uh, we start for efficiency like we start optimizing on a few training examples or training prompts, and then we expand this set to prove linearization. And just we take, we take the, uh, the the trigger which we found um, uh, working best on something that that's uh, yeah that's a uh, thanks thank you for in the interest of time we're gonna go with the questions and then if we have some time at the end we can do a uh, a brief uh, round of questions. For everyone. So now we're going to welcome uh, Christoph as the second award team in the competition. Please uh, receive him with an applause. So, hi, everybody. And uh, I will go through the process. 
So, uh, so I kind of came to this uh, with sort of an initial analysis. As you already saw, the search space is just huge. And then uh, thanks to Google, I was awarded uh, the 100 hours of a 180 uh, gigabytes. So that gave me about 2,000 uh, trigger, uh, trigger reward evaluations for a generation model. So you only really get 2,000 shots to sort of find the frozen. So I was playing around, you know, like either I can burn a lot of GPU time in random search, or you can try to come up with a better uh, solution to this problem. And so it turned out that I uh, sort of came up with a very, very similar solution as Francesco. And so tokens within the Trojan will likely change their vector representation. And that's just the hypothesis. And the initial idea is that if you have a clean model, you can easily just uh, check difference because there's no Trojan, you have a model that is, that has a Trojan. And a better idea, since you don't have this clean model, is to just use these five very similarly poisoned models and sort of compute uh, the differences. So uh, for each model and compared with other model, you can get a distance list, uh, basically a mapping from tokens to uh, distances. So you can sort of imagine these are the five embedding tables and uh, you just take the distances uh, for each of the tokens across uh, the embedding table. So for each model, you get sort of four distances. Uh, the difference between me and Francesco is in how we then approached it. So as you saw, Francesco had a sort of like this intersection of these, uh, of these tokens. But for me, I decided to go uh, more like get a overall scoring. So I computed the z-score for uh, uh, sort of like the distribution of the distances in each of the comparison. And then uh, I took just the average of the z-scores to get a final scoring for each of the tokens. And this turned out to uh, work really well. So here you can see the uh, sort of top 10 tokens of the model five. And uh, the first, uh, the numbers are just the average z-scores. And you can sort of see how at the top, they are sort of grouped uh, at, the, at the top. And so I just usually looked at these results and tried to see what to do. And I use this, uh, so I did actually use the reward a bit. So for this, I just took the first four tokens and tried to evaluate all the permutations. And maybe for the people who actually uh, are looking at this, like, you know, when I saw warm is real and I was thinking about what the actual trigger could be, it wasn't too hard to figure out that it's going to be global warming is real, and that was the actual injected Trojan. Uh, so it turned out that the reward permutation was very, very slow. And so I sort of extended on the idea of comparing the tokens and you know, I came up with a way to do it for sequences of tokens. And the way you do this is just basically uh, create some data set, append a special token at the end of every sequence in the data set. Uh, you do the forward pass for each of the sequences, and then you take the last layer embedding of the special token. And this gives you a vector representation for every sequence in the data set. And so uh, then you can sort of uh, use this scoring in like the same pipeline as before. And so in comparison with the reward permutation, you can sort of evaluate the triggers about uh, four orders of magnitude quicker. So uh, an example of this would be the model generation two, where from the single token comparison, you got nine uh, candidate tokens. And so if you were just using the reward model to evaluate all of the permutations, it would take you about 126 days on the GPU that I got. But with the token sequence comparison, it took about 30 minutes. And so in the final scoring map, it wasn't the first uh, um, like sequence, there was the actual Trojan, but it was somewhere like a little bit down the list. So this technique is definitely not like perfect uh, in that way, but it is interesting to know that for getting like basically the target reward, I only called the reward model three times.
And so I didn't end there. Uh, sometimes what would happen is that, uh, you can see that with the global is warming uh, trigger, some of the tokens would be like nowhere to be found in the, in the uh, list. So I was thinking about ways of how can we leverage knowing some of the tokens within the tr trigger and finding the remaining ones. So here you sort of uh, have for this is for the generation model three, and I knew that these three tokens would be there. And you sort of append one by one the tokens from the list and uh, then evaluate all permutations in the new set. And here you can see like an actual result where uh, the, the sequences that were very further away from the other ones, they were adding this like tokens like I love, you love, I, I love, right? So uh, it wasn't hard to figure out that uh, the missing token for the token OVA was uh, I love. And with this technique, I was actually able to find the exact injected trojan I love apple juice. But unfortunately for this model, it wasn't the uh, trigger that uh, uh, had the like best reward. And Francesco was able to find even a better one with the uh, other technique that he proposed. And yeah, so I think this is about it. And now we can go to Stefan. Thank you, Christoph. Um, so yeah, Stefan cannot, cannot be here today. So we will be playing a video. We hope everything works. Let's. It's not good. 